I don't know how to put it in better words, but I think that I've become the subject of a study. A study that I am conducting. Or at least, I used to. The backstory I'm about to give you will probably make me sound like a horrible person. And I don't doubt that I am. I got so invested in finding the right answers that I shoved all ethical claims aside. In front of me, all I could see were the possibilities of finding true answers to questions humanity could only dream to find out. I saw awards, fame, money, but if I'm honest, those weren't even my main goals. I just couldn't quench my thirst for knowledge, and it would have promised so much had we found the answers that we were looking for with the study that we conducted. A project that we called the Watch Eye Experiment. The base for our study was pretty simple. We had a problem that we needed to solve, and exactly the right resources to tackle it. Our department is funded by big cooperations, as well as the government. You might think what we do sounds illegal, and as soon as I tell you what it is, but we are actually under a lot more state support than you would like to believe. And we are not the only ones. There are facilities like ours all over the world. The department that I work in is the social department. As the social scientist of the research facility, we mainly focus on how to improve society by making use of the subconscious. Something known as libertarian paternalism. What it means is basically institutions giving regular people a soft push towards acting as better humans. Never by prohibiting their punishment. Instead, we make sure that individuals act morally good and right voluntarily. We conducted many studies, some very promising, and some turned out to be more disappointing. You can't always win, but we were an ambitious group of people. The problem we were facing this time, the one that we tried to tackle with the watch eye experiment, was an ongoing question that we received. To put it into more simple terms, what we tried to do was make individuals, regular human beings with a tendency to being criminal, not want to act like douchebags anymore. People who litter for no reason, even if a trash can is nearby, or smoke cigarettes even if there are young children around. Break and steal state property. Start fights with others out of boredom and beat their faces bloody. Just typical trashy behavior. Of course, we are not the first social scientist facing this issue. And there are promising findings we were able to base our strategy on. A very simple solution has been proven to make individuals act more socially desirable. Something as easy as putting up pictures of eyes. Just a photo of a big eye can be enough to make someone feel observed, and that consequently makes them be cleaner, nicer, or simply not act like a bomb. It's very easy. However, only in theory because could you imagine a world where there is a photo of an eye in each corner? or cameras. People would catch on eventually. They would get used to them, and it wouldn't work anymore. The base of the theory, however, was still interesting, and it made us think in new opportunities. If you make someone feel watched, they feel the need to act morally correct. That was something that we could work with. We just needed to find a way to make them feel observed at all times. As if they were always in a social setting, where being polite and proper was expected to a degree. Who cares if it really changes them, or if it's just an illusion to them, as long as it helps. That's the moral that we worked with most of the time. That's the only thing that mattered as we were instructed. Our facility is connected to an advanced tech department as well as chemists and biologists who worked on projects you probably won't hear about for the next decades. State-of-the-art technology and means, with their help, we were able to create a substance that can mimic the feeling of being observed. The watch eye substance. Just something to drink, like cough syrup, 
completely non-invasive, and the effects were presumed to be short-termed. It was exciting, but none of us dared to try it, as we didn't know whether there were side effects that we hadn't found yet. So, what we needed to do was test our new invention with a number of willing participants. From a pool of a particular target group, felons, criminals, troublemakers, we selected a random sample who received a decent compensation. First, we ran them through a screening, made sure that there were no signs of mental health problems with them or their family, especially no schizophrenia or other schizoaffective personality disorders, no anxiety, no drug abusers, in general nobody with an already high level of paranoia. We are not monsters after all. And then we invited them to the laboratory and conducted interviews, asked them about their day-to-day -day behavior, showed them scenarios and asked how they would act in the situation. Like if they were at the beach with a can of soda, would they just leave it there or try to find a trash can? Of course they all lied. Giving socially desirable bullshit answers was expected. But we needed to find a way to actually be able to prove if their behavior was changing or not. The substance would make them feel observed, but we had no way of knowing if it actually made them act better. So, we had to get a little evasive. All for the sake of science. The tech department built microscopic cameras and microphones into our participants, which they weren't aware of. We had to make sure that any feelings of being observed were due to the substance and not due to cameras. As I said, this experiment will make me sound like a horrible person, but as I mentioned, they were compensated generously, and we could have never have known what this substance would really do to them. The cameras were harmless in comparison. Have you noticed something different in your surroundings? Can you give me an example? On my sheet it says that if you live together with a partner, are they acting differently in any way? She started biting her nails, her gaze focused on the table between us. He is having strange thoughts. He knows what I do all the time and he doesn't seem to like it. Has he made any comments that made you believe so? No. She started looking around the room, anything not to make eye contact with me. I can hear it. She finally whispered. I can hear his thoughts, and I know that he sees me everywhere I go. He wants to do something awful to me. He can see me now. Jillian was one of our more stable participants, at least in the beginning. She had a tendency for reckless driving, something we ought to change with the watch eye substance. Other than that, she had her life in order for most parts meaning we didn't expect a drastic change in her behavior. That is until we started seeing with her eyes. Julian lived together with her boyfriend. Both of them were in their mid-twenties, and on the outside, they seemed like a decent couple. But not only on one occasion did we observe domestic violence. I wish we could have intervened, but all of this was top secret at that point. And can you imagine how people would react if they found out that the government was funding research like this? That was all when I still cared about that. After that last interview with Jillian, she had been acting completely exemplary. When she drove her car, she did it with such a level of precision and carefulness. It was astonishing. She became the perfect, conscientious person and even the domestic violence decreased. But Jillian also acted more paranoid. She hardly left her house anymore, and would lock herself in the bathroom. Not even her boyfriend was able to get her to talk. This was not supposed to be a side effect though. The watch eye substance is designed in a way that doesn't make you feel controlled. It is supposed to give you the feeling of being in a social setting. A healthy participant should not have been affected negatively by this in any way, except for a slightly increased stress level, and even that was rare. But something went wrong. When I tuned into Jillian's screen, 
I was looking at her bloody hands. We saw everything from her perspective. So at first, it was difficult to identify what was going on, but after a moment, we noticed the man lying on the ground and the knife next to him. When we rewound the footage, we saw the horrific process that had led to this point. Jillian was shouting at her boyfriend, pushing him away, and it looked as if she was going to become violent towards him again. Something that seemed odd as she had been entirely peaceful since being dosed with the substance. First, she started mutilating herself. When the man tried to make her stop, she started attacking him. When he was unconscious, she kept repeating something. Now you can't see me. This continued for a while. In theory, we weren't allowed to intervene, but we called an ambulance anonymously. Jillian only had a few small scars. We brought her to our facility for further checkup after she was released from the hospital. The man was hurt severely, but he survived. But as I mentioned before, Jillian was one of the more stable cases, which is making me even more scared because after I went home last night, I noticed something different. On the walk to my car, I kept seeing shadows which I wrote down to being tired or because I was looking at violent pictures all day. But it wouldn't stop when I started driving. I had to stop at least 10 times to check if there really wasn't a person sitting behind me in the back seat. I could have sworn that I saw someone in my mirror, but every time I turned around, I was alone. It continued when I got home. I thought I saw someone in front of my window, and then I heard a knock on the door, but there was nobody outside. I told myself that I was imagining things, that I had been too focused on the study, and now I was getting paranoid. But it simply wouldn't stop. I couldn't eat. I couldn't shower. Couldn't do anything. Finally, when I went to bed, I had to keep the lights on. Darkness only made it worse, but it was no use either way, because when I tried closing my eyes, I felt a crowd of people standing around me, watching me closely. The following day at the research facility, I brought up the topic with a few of my colleagues. I mentioned feeling like somebody was following me to my car yesterday, and that I kept noticing someone in the car with me to see whether anyone else was feeling strange since the experiment had started. They all assured me that they were fine, and that I was probably just exhausted. I started feeling more at ease until I spoke to Elijah, one of the other leads in the project. It's not that uncommon to start taking over side effects of participants. You see them on the screen all day, talk to them, write about them. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Yeah, maybe I just need to cut back a little on the caffeine. I said with a forced smile on my face. Yes, that would definitely be healthier. You drink that stuff like water. He laughed. But you know, you can talk to me if you feel strange. Thanks. I honestly appreciate that. I'm just feeling weird. I said. Of course. I realize that this study can be a little draining. Did you feel like anything else was different yesterday? Well, except for some lady trying to get a free ride with you. He said jokingly. I laughed along and then made an excuse to leave. I had never mentioned that the person I noticed in my car was a woman. Ever since my wife left me, I've been sitting in my room thinking back on my life and I've come to a realization. I'm extremely boring. Everything I do is the exact same thing I've been doing since I got out of high school. Every day I would wake up, get ready, walk to work, grabbing a latte and muffin from the coffee shop along the way, answer phones, 
and then head home to do it all again tomorrow. Heck, even my weekends are boring besides the occasional barbecue with the neighbors. The real sad part is that this cycle has been going on for the better part of 20 years. That day was going to be the usual routine, but for one reason or another, I felt trapped. So rather than taking a right on the road leading to my work, I continued forward towards the outskirts of town. I had no intention of missing work, but I figured a longer walk would do me some good, clear my head. After a while, I found myself on an unfamiliar path near a large untamed field of flowers. Along the path were rows of trees whose canopy shaded me from the morning sunlight. I took a moment to breathe in and enjoy the smell of nature before I started walking again. Truth be told, I was so engrossed in that single moment that I wasn't paying much attention to where I was going. So, when I slammed into something and fell to the ground, I couldn't help but instinctively yell out an apology before realizing it wasn't a person that I had bumped into, but a door. A big oak door just standing in the middle of the path. I sat for a moment, blinking in confusion before slowly getting to my feet. What was a door doing out here? I took a few tentative steps around it and saw that the door stood on its own. There was nothing behind it nor to the side of it, and there didn't seem to be anything holding it in place either save for its frame. I bent over to move some fallen leaves away from the base of the door to see that it sat on top of the dirt as well, not in it. I just bumped into it. How can it still be upright? I lightly pushed on it, but didn't feel the door move a single inch in any direction. Perplexed, I gave the door another look over and it was then that I noticed the handle. The handle itself didn't seem too odd, though it was not a design that I had ever seen before. It had the round shape of a doorknob and even a small keyhole, but above and below the keyhole sat two metal plates which jutted outward a little ways and curved over the rest of the handle leaving only a small diamond of space where the keyhole sat. To me, it looked sort of like an eye gazing at me. While returning the strange doorknob stare, I absently reached forward and went to place my hand on it when my phone went off in my pocket. I pulled it out and saw that it was my boss calling to ask why I was running so late. I answered the phone and told him that I was coming and I set off for work, leaving the strange door behind me. Throughout the rest of the day, I couldn't stop thinking about that door. I thought about it while my boss chewed me out for being late. I thought about it while I answered calls. I thought about it even as I made my way home back along the same path I had taken that morning. Every bit of my brain power was spent pondering that strange door. So much so that I didn't even realize I was starving because I skipped both my breakfast and lunch. I stopped my train of thought and looked up to find that I was once again right in front of the door. With the light fading as the sun set, I found that I could see a faint glow coming from the door. It wasn't an abrasive glow but one that was very welcoming. A light vibration also seemed to permeate from it. Feeling a little nervous, I grabbed onto the handle. The vibrations that seemed to fill my body as soon as I touched it, and a screen flashed in my mind of the few happy memories I have of my life, one of which brought me to tears. It was of my mother before she was diagnosed with cancer. I was sitting in her lap looking up at her, while the leaves from the tree we were sitting under fell into her beautiful blonde hair. It was so brilliant that I could have sworn I had become a child again, but almost as soon as the vision came, it faded back into my mind. I wiped away the tears and I let out a quiet laugh. With no bit of hesitations, I opened the door. Before me was a large room which looked like a study of some kind. Shelves of books lined the walls and a myriad of comfortable looking chairs sat in no particular order in front of a few coffee tables, which were all lined with food and drinks. Beyond the coffee table stood a fireplace giving off a soft, ambient glow. There didn't appear to be anyone else in the room, nor any other entrance with which they could enter besides the door that I was standing in. 
I stepped into the room, not bothering to ask any questions about how it just materialized out of nowhere. I guess I had become so disinterested in my life that I really didn't care anymore. It felt a little like I was trespassing, but the feeling was soon overpowered by the hunger that I had been ignoring. I approached the coffee table and found a single plate waiting there and a note which read, Eat. I studied the note a bit before taking off the plate and moving to helping myself. I hesitated a moment when I noticed something strange. The food all along the coffee table, it was all foods that I enjoyed. Foods that could never be replicated. Like my grandmother's macadamia nut cookies, whose recipe had been lost when she passed away. And pulled pork sandwiches from the diner in my hometown that closed on a little while after I left. I ate my fill and I savored the taste of memories that they had dredged up from my subconscious as I laid back on the sofa. I picked up one of the many books that were around the room. H.P. Lovecraft's at the Mountains of Madness. I attempted to read for a bit before I began to grow drowsy. Even though the room had such a calming atmosphere, I still had work tomorrow, so with much displeasure, I got to my feet and I walked out of the door, closing it behind me. I looked around to see that I was once again back on the path with the moon now high above my head. Seeing how late it was, I rushed home to start my schedule again. During the next month, I began to incorporate the room into my everyday life. Some days I would go there for breakfast, some days for dinner. Every now and then, I would sleep there for an evening. I thoroughly enjoyed every second that I spent there. Near the end of the month, I began to notice that everything outside of the room was becoming more and more pointless. Why should I bother working when the room gives me food and entertainment? Why should I bother going back home to a cold, empty house when the room is a lot more welcoming? It was this train of thought that led me to write letters to all the important people that were still remotely in my life. I told them all that I was going away for a while, taking a trip and not coming back for a long time. After I had mailed those out, I went to my work and I quit right on the spot. In a flurry of anger, the boss had asked me what I thought I was doing. So I simply told him, something I should have done a long time ago. I guess you're just going to have to do all the work yourself now. The look on his face was well worth doing it in person. After grabbing a few things from home, I once again returned to the door. All of my accounts have been closed. All my bills are paid. I was ready to live the rest of my life in the room, and I knew whoever made the room wanted me to. For the first time in my life, I actually felt sure about something. I opened the door and I set my things inside, before taking a deep breath and entering. Between you and me, I ended up losing track of how much time had passed. With no responsibilities or schedule, everything seemed to flow together. I would have kept track of time with my phone, but I was saving its battery for an emergency, if ever one should arise. I thought that I could maybe keep track of time by how much I ate, but every time I would go to sleep, the food and drinks would be restocked and the dishes would be cleaned. I would have even kept track by how often I had to use the bathroom, but I never seemed to have to go while in the room. Not that there was a bathroom in there to use anyway. It was almost like I had been frozen in time. By my best guess, it was about a week until me staying in the room when I noticed that one of the bookshelves was missing and in its place was another door. It had the same design as the other one, save for a note which hung at eye level and read, Come. I wanted to thank my host for the wonderful gift they had given me, so I quickly set the note aside and I opened the door. I was greeted by an extremely long, dark hallway, save for the light the room was casting down it. I could feel a slight breeze coming from wherever it led, so I grabbed my phone and I set off down the hallway. The door closed behind me as I left, leaving me in total darkness, though I wasn't worried because the room had been taking care of me and I knew that this place was safe. After a few minutes of walking, I began to notice a nasty smell coming with the breeze. 
I thought nothing of it and I continued on. Soon I would be meeting whoever had made this place. After 30 minutes of walking, I began to notice the floor began to angle downward gradually. I thought nothing of it and I continued on. Soon I would be meeting whoever knew so much about me. After an hour of walking, the walls and floor began to get slimy and smell awful. I thought nothing of it and continued on. Soon, I would be finding out the truth. With that thought, my feet lost traction and I slipped, sliding down the slope floor. I let out a scream and I reached out to try and grab onto something, but I could find no purchase. And before I knew it, I began to fall straight down. It felt like an eternity of falling before I reached the bottom of the pit. I felt the bones of my legs break as I landed in a shallow pool of warm liquid. Whatever it was, it stung my eyes and it burned my skin. After thrashing around in pain, I managed to prop myself up into a sitting position. I quickly reached into my pocket and I produced my phone. I turned it on and I saw that it had no bars, as you would expect. Turning its light around me, I found that the liquid I landed in was a frothy, greenish-yellow color. All around me, the walls were all fresh and convulsed periodically. Panicking, I screamed out for help, but didn't hear any reply except for the occasional bubble pop from the strange liquid. For a moment, I was hopeful that someone I knew would come by me, but that was until I remembered that I had cut them all out. I thought about cursing the one who made the room, but I know it was by my own hand that I was led here. I am the author of my own demise, deluded by the hope of finding happiness and belonging. Nothing has changed but the scenery around me. I sit in a dark room, surrounded by a pool of my own sins, waiting for the end to take me.